Thank you for coming today to our colloquium, and it's my honor to introduce Greg Allen, who is coming from the Jet Propulsion Lab, and some of you know him very well. Um, but Greg graduated from Cal State University in Chico. Chico State, baby. Chico State, okay, yeah. in 2005, and he moved to DPL right after and became the lead of the Radiation Effect Center. Is that what it's called? Sure. Center for, Center space, for space Radiation. radiation. <laughs> newly, newly formed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, thank you very much for doing this and telling us about radiation effects. No. Space. Thank you very much. Appreciate the introduction. And <laughs> thanks, Devin. Uh, appreciate the invitation to come here uh, today. So I guess professors, I, I kind of know, but who do I have in the audience, I guess? How many of you are undergrads in Nuki? Wow, very well lined up here. And so graduate, graduate folks in the back. Okay, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> just for a point of reference, I'm, I, so most of you are gonna have, or at least the graduate students are gonna have kind of a fundamental understanding of a lot of the language that I'm going to use. But I, over the years, it's, you know, having conversations with, you know, folks that are coming from nuclear engineering areas or higher energy particle physics and the, and the folks who operate the cyclotrons who I interface mostly with in my job. Um, there's definitely a, an interesting gap in how we approach using the same tools. So I'm gonna touch on that a little bit and I'm like a super informal person. So if you have questions, just interject or raise your hand or whatever. So um, why is it not looking now? Okay, well, that's enough of that. Oh, I know why. Okay. There we go. So a little bit about me. I grew up like two and a half hours away in a small town called Durham, California. Mostly just grew almonds and rice there. Um, ended up going to Chico State. And background is in computer engineering. I was going to go and get a law degree because I wanted to be a patent lawyer. But I had an internship at JPL in 2004. And they called me with a job offer and I was like a lot of debt or go make money. And I said, go make money. And I am very, very happy for that because I really found my passion. I'm very, very passionate about radiation effects. Um, I've been doing it now for almost 20 years and I, I can't imagine doing anything else, especially, especially patent law. I don't care. <laughs> it's enjoyable. Um, I'm our SCE test lead. So I'm always hanging out with Devin up at the 88. Um, I'll try to tie in as many parallels as I can to the, to the cyclotron up the hill here uh, at LPNL. Um, yes, sir. <laughs> it's all good. Like I said, informal. Um, I'm our group lead, so I'm not management, but I'm like a technical resource for the group. Um, Lake Shike, who uh, you, you also reached out to, he was going to try to be here today, but couldn't, is our group supervisor. And our, I am our lead co-lead for the JPL Center for Space Radiation. Um, along with Insu Jun. So Insu is, the, Insu is an environment specialist, which is a whole other talk. I'm going to touch on the natural space environment a little bit as it's relevant to the kinds of um, engineering that I do in my day job. Um, but uh, that's a whole other field of study, right? So radiation effects is very, very multidisciplinary. I decided to be like Rodney Dangerfield, and that's probably too old for most of you in here. But I went back to school with a lot of gray hair, and I'm actually working on a master's in systems architecture. Um, I think our field has been very focused on component level um, assurance, and it's, it's really moving into kind of a system down rather than components up, which is a which is a very defense um, oriented way coming back from the fifties of, of architecting instrumentation and, and spacecraft and 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 uh, you know engineering endeavors. So, uh, other than that. I have a wife and two kids. Um, I think I'm a family man. They're everything to me, and they're why I do everything that I do. I love basketball. You see a pair of custom NASA shoes right there, some Air Force Ones I had made. So I try to combine my passions as much as I can. So I'm very passionate about work, hoops, and family. Yeah? Is your internship in like computer engineering? No. So, you know, uh, a professor was walking down the halls of Chico State, and he said, Hey, Greg, you want an internship at JPL? I was a junior. I said, Yeah. I had no idea what JPL was. So uh, I just knew I needed an internship and that sounded like, hey, path of least resistance, that sounds good. Um, and so there was a stack of resumes at, at JPL in the uh, organization that I now work in. And they pulled mine off and said, this guy looks like he can use an oscilloscope, we'll take him. I don't know what it was about my resume that made him think that, but I spent the summer there very randomly. And then, and I had no idea what radiation effects was. 
I spent the summer working on uh, firmware for a field programmable gate array to exercise an SDRAM, or exercising a memory with an FPGA. And they were having trouble with some of the code. And I knew nothing about FPGAs and nothing about SDRAMs, but had to figure it out. So I spent the summer figuring it out, um, kind of reverse engineering the system. And at the end of the summer, I was able to do um, some very simple radiation testing with Californium source. Um, and uh, in the little vacuum chamber they had on lab and was able to do some, some very basic testing and, and that was my summer. So a very common theme that you'll find in radiation effects is that nobody plans to be in it. We are, there's no radiation effects degree, right? There's nuclear engineering, there's high energy particle physics, there's applied physics like device physics, and there's electrical engineering and computer science and computer engineering, right? But there's really no, radiation effects degree. And so it's very more morning I went to the office half hour early and I sat on the trash can in Larry Edmonds office and talked to him about charge collection. And I also made a rule that every night I would read a paper. Right out of the out of the community, out of the transactions on nuclear science, where we publish most of our stuff. So I would get questions in my head and go down that like you know clicking rabbit hole of trying to figure something out. And so um, I, I I think I should still be doing that, but I kind of broke that rule. I, I have a desire to still read a paper at night, and that doesn't happen. But um, as you go into the field, you're going to find you know whatever field you go into that you're going to have a, a baseline of of knowledge. But what you really want to do is learn how to learn and, and keep doing that, right? Because that doesn't stop. Um, and, and frankly, part of my reason for going back to school also was to show my children that education doesn't ever stop, right? So it doesn't actually do me much good in my field. <laughs> but I'm a curious individual, so I like to keep learning. Thank you for the other question. Um, so generally speaking, you know, what are radiation effects? I try to make it uh, about as simple as possible. And you see a cube up there. Um, in in the the language that we use in our field is a rectangular parallel pipette, but it's actually not uh, that kind of um, volume. But it's it's um, usually more like an egg. But we call it an RPP. But you can think of it just as a, as a volume in an integrated circuit, right? And we're taking some kind of ionizing radiation from the outside, so it's coming from somewhere, and it's different kinds of radiation of different energies. And that is going through that volume and depositing energy. And so the mechanism for that, how that happens is, is what the field of radiation effects is all about. And you can come from several different perspectives. You can try to understand at a very granular level what's going on in that volume, right? And try to understand the mechanisms. And that's really if you're coming from the perspective of making semiconductors. On the other side, it's more of what I do is looking at the effects on the outside, right? So you have a device, you're going to a particle accelerator or you're using a cobalt 60 gamma source and you're looking at how the device properties change as you're irradiated, right? And so for different types of effects, like single event effects, which I'm gonna to try to talk more about today, this volume is associated with the depletion region of a circuit or a node, right? For TID, it's more about an insula insulating layer or an offset, right? So where this radiation is hitting and, and how it's interacting dictates and what kind of device you're working with dictates the kind of effects that you're going to see. Um, it, it seems simple when you look at it this way, but obviously these devices are very, very complex. And so there's lots of different effects and different kind of synergies and all that. So um, you, you, you want to come at it from two different perspectives. Uh, what makes this hard? So um, one, the field is always evolving, right? We are always behind technology trying to catch up. So manufacturers of technology, whether it's, I don't know where I put my cell phone, but the cell phone, right, is, is pushing the boundaries of the latest and greatest technology. We as, as uh, aerospace, whether it's civil space or commercial space, want to take advantage of that. Um, we want the lowest power. We want the most processing we can get out of things. But we need it to be resilient. We need it to be able to, to survive. And it takes a fair amount of time, money, and effort to do that. And so we're trying to always keep up with evolving technology. And it's moving much, much faster than, than we can do that. Um, another is dynamic range. And this is this is a little bit of a philosophical point. But if you think about it, you know, we're dealing with galactic cosmic rays that are coming outside the solar system, right? Light years away. But we're also considering 
the the interactions at the atomic scale, right? So those are that's ten to the thirty one orders of magnitude that we have to like contemplate in our minds. You know, another another metric is energy. Um, we're dealing with GeV particles, but we're also considering things at the device level with a band gap of silicon around one eV, right? And so there's there's many other metrics you can look at time in terms of space weather. Um, there's there's space weather and space climate. So weather is something like a solar flare. So there's a relatively short event. It may be minutes or hours or days of an intense radiation environment that that is somewhat unpredictable. Um, versus the climate, right? The changing of the solar cycle over time, right? Which happens over decades. And so you need to kind of contemplate both things. Um, and so there's 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 a scaling to all this that is that's pretty interesting. Um, and then, as I mentioned, it's a very multidisciplinary field, and I think that's what attracted me to it the most, is that there are people coming in from lots of different backgrounds, whether that's education or whether that's, um, you know, a career background, and they all have to kind of come together to make it all work. And that part's really interesting to me because there's always something new to learn from somebody else who's coming at it from a different perspective. Okay, I have a quick video here. Uh, sorry. Can we, I'm going to put the volume up. I don't know. All right. Permissions to other planets, protecting non toxic script. If a single bit of information controls a critical function on your spacecraft, let's say your thruster, and that goes from a one to a zero, from a on off, or vice versa, you can lose the mission. That's why the computer on the Perseverance rover that just landed on Mars is 20 years old. It's a power PC launched in 2001 with only 256 megabytes of RAM and two gigabytes of flash storage. But it is radiation targeting, meaning the design, materials, circuits, and software are complete to expand four times the radiation of an ordinary computer. It's been used on over a dozen space missions going back to 2005. In fact, when we first started doing the power PC testing years ago, the way we did it, we just simply stuck an operating system processor in a beamline where we, we generate these uh, particles on the planet and look for new things about you can kind of figure out what's going wrong and what's undo that so you don't get to the beamline and stuff because the spacecraft they get to do that mode is basically on the planet. So that was late, my, my supervisor. Oh, I got to mute over here. Sorry. For, I don't know if any of you saw it, but the link is in there. Um, uh, Are you muted? Yeah. No? <laughs> I am now? Maybe? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, and so that was just a clip out of there. But the point that I wanted to make there is that you know, we've been using the same processor technology for the systems that we have to have that are very, very robust for decades now. Right, but I wanted to contrast that with another thing that came along with the rover, the Mars helicopter ingenuity. So I don't, maybe you saw this in the news. I'm not sure, but the technology demonstration that went along with this rover had, at the time, probably the, one of the most advanced pieces of processing technology that mankind had ever created, humankind had ever created, in um, this Snapdragon SOC, uh, some of the processing capability that's in your cell phone, right? And so. Um, the point is that we have to exist as radiation engineers and, and um, folks who develop technology for space in both of these regions, right? And the only way for us to do that is to understand at the technology level, component level, what exactly is going on in, in an adverse environment. This could be temperature, uh, it could be radiation, it could be vacuum of space, it could be dust on Mars, right? We understand we need to understand how these environmental impacts influence the survivability of these um, uh, missions that we have right so again you've got you've got 20 year old technology that's the heart and brains of that rover and then you've got some of the most sorry Siri uh, you got some of the most advanced technology and we tested it all here right at, at the ADA and so um, it's really important for us to understand and it's it comes down to use right how are you using it where are you using it how long are you using it but you can't the biggest piece of that equation is the data that goes along with it, right? So I'm going to breeze through this part a little bit. These are just kind of basic definitions in terms of, you know, I just want to have a common uh, vernacular for us to use. But ionization with respect to semiconductors, right? You get a charged particle that could be, uh, you know, a proton, electron, gamma ray, uh, heavy ion, et cetera. 
and there's electromagnetic interaction um, with the atoms in a in a semiconductor, right, in an electronic device. So that particle is going to come in. You're going to have charge separation, right? You're going to create electron hole pairs. Everything in our field has to do with that carrier generation. And so um, when that particle is passing through, that that operation, that separation will happen many, 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 many times, depending on you know device parameters and what kind of radiation it is. Um, a couple other simple definitions: flux and fluence. Uh, flux is is the amount of particles that are passing through an area in a given time. Influence is the total amount of, of particles in a given time, also normalized by area, right? Uh, water going through a hose and how much filled up the bucket. It's kind of how I explain it to my mom, at least. Um, and then uh, LET. So this is one area where our fields, radiation effects, and the field uh, of nuclear engineering or high-energy particle physics kind of have a, a bit of a gap, right? Not in what LET is, but how we think about it. Um, so LET, uh, or stopping power there at the top, is, is uh, the rate of energy deposition or energy loss per unit length path, right? So DEDX or DEDS is, is how you'll see it. Um, in terms of LET, we're looking at that uh, stopping power in a given material. So we're taking MeV or centimeters at our common units and dividing by density. And typically uh, we're using silicon, but you can use uh, whatever material you're considering. Uh, for us, it's almost always silicon. So you're dividing by density um, or milligram, milligrams per centimeter cube, and you get the interesting units of MeV centimeter squared per milligram. Um, where we differ, is that most high energy particle physics, um, nuclear engineering really care about what exactly the particle is, what's the Z. What we care about really is just the LET. And the next chart is going to explain that a little bit. And so, is this work? No. no. Oh, you see the mouse, I think, right? Oh, no, sorry. There we go. Um, no, it's not working. All right, I had a cool little little pointer and now it's failed. Okay, so you can see on the left, this spectra, right? And so what we're doing here is taking all of the species of particles and over various energies in space and averaging out those particles to an LET spectra. So we're looking at um, on the x-axis, LET and the units that I just described, and on the y-axis, flux, right, and particles uh, per centimeter squared per day, so per area per time. Um, and that's our environment. We take that environment, we transport it through shielding material, and that is our fundamental risk, right? That's what we're going to observe at the electronics level. And so from a requirements perspective, what are we worried about? That's what drives it. So that's what's in space. I have, it's an eye chart, you don't need to read it, but on the right, you can see what's available at the 88. Right, and so there's these different species of, of ions, right? Which, uh, depending on the energy, re results in different LETs. So you can, you can kind of see it there. There's the entrance LET and LET at the Bragg peak and its range. So we do care about range. So we're not completely independent of energy, but as long as we have sufficient range, which is usually about 100 microns of penetration in silicon, we're okay with whatever ion as long as it gets us the LET that we care about, right? So we can cover the spectra that's going to be in the environment. So that's what's really important for us. I'm going to breeze through a little bit of the natural space environment. So there's lots of threats in the natural space environment. What we're talking about today are really the particle radiation, right? The electrons, protons, higher energy electrons, protons, and heavy ions, right? And there's three main sources of that that we worry about. There's solar radiation, there's the galactic cosmic rays, that are ever present, and there's particles trapped in the magnetosphere, right, of celestial bodies, planets. Um, there are other sources. Um, there's plasma. Usually, these are too low energy to penetrate through in spacecraft walls, right? And and so we don't worry about that as much. There's neutral gas particles, again, not a concern. And micrometeoroids and orbital debris. Orbital debris is a problem, and uh, space junk is becoming more of a problem. But that's somebody else's problem, not mine. Yeah. The solar wind isn't energetic enough. This, yeah. it, so not from the, so it, it influences the natural space environment from the galactic cosmic ray perspective, um, not energetic enough to cause, there's, there are issues with charging on the surface of the spacecraft, yeah. but not so much from a uh, yeah, component level threat, which is really what I'm trying to focus on. Right. So spacecraft, spacecraft charging 
Is that another area of concern for us? It's just not one that I exist in, right? Um, so there's there's surface charging, and there's also charging that happens internally, say like um, with conductors and things, so like cabling and whatnot. And you have to deal with that, right? There's no ground from your satellite to Earth to, to discharge the charging that occurs, right? You have these energetic particles. Things are charging up, and if the field is large enough, that's going to jump somewhere to a lower potential. And depending on what that, how much energy there is, that arc can cause very, very bad problems for spacecraft. And frankly, it, it looks like a destructive SDE. So there's lots of confusion sometimes from a, um, you know, Tiger team or on-orbit anomaly, like what actually happens, um, whether that was charging or whether it was some kind of destructive SDE. And frankly, from the commercial side, uh, if you're talking about like a Raytheon or a Boeing, they like to blame uh, charging because insurance covers it. <laughs> Whereas radiation effects is, uh, you know, that that was your responsibility to cover. So there's an interesting fact there. So you'll see ISD blamed a lot. Um, so I'm going to breeze through the uh, various environments. Um, again, you have solar wind, but all you'll see on the next chart that mostly just influences our galactic cosmic rays. Um, <clears throat> other than what I was just talking about. What we really worry about are the, the, the particle events, right? The flares, if you will. And so, you know, these are somewhat random. Uh, we can we do our best to predict intensity and frequency, but we don't necessarily know when it's coming. We have monitors that'll kind of let us know. Um, they're very intense, which means high flux, right? But they range in energy. So um, when we think about this natural space environment and how do we mitigate that, shielding is the first thing that comes to mind, right? And so we can shield some of these, particles, but not all of them, right? And so when you're thinking about these things, you have to think about where, in terms of the component that you're worried about, where that is in your spacecraft, right? Are these solar cells that are exposed to everything or, or sensors or, de or detectors that have a lot of exposure? Or <clears throat> is it a memory that's buried deep inside the chassis, right? And so that kind of transport analysis is a really important piece to uh, radiation effects. You can see the little video on the right, that is the SOHO instrument, I uh, think Solar Heliospheric Observatory Mission, and it's capturing uh, an SPE there. And so you can see kind of like the background level of, of not much noise. And then when that flare comes out, you're seeing a whole bunch of particle interaction with the sensor. So uh, that's just pointing to the kind of level of intensity that you're going to see. And you can imagine um, if you were doing a very critical operation, say, entry, descent, and landing onto Mars, and you get hit with one of these and your, your processor resets, you're not going to land on Mars, you're going to crash on Mars, right? So it's important to understand this risk, and that's that's why we do the testing that we do. Um, as I mentioned, there's a solar cycle, right? so the solar winds that influence galactic cosmic rays and the uh, frequency of, of particle events, solar particle events, and so um, also it's important to track the climate. So this is kind of what I refer to as climate. And the instantaneous events are more like weather, and we got hit with a thunderstorm, versus the seasons of the solar system, right? And so those are the kind of two ways to look at it. Where you're going and, and when you're going there is very important to understand risk. Uh, galactic cosmic rays. So these are relatively low intensity in terms of flux, <clears throat> but they're very, very high energy. So shielding doesn't really work, right? Uh, we, we can shield a little bit, but then there's diminishing returns after about 25 mils of aluminum, right? So um, we have to contend with these, we have to understand these, and, and this is what drove that spec, that chart, the spectra of, um, uh, of LET, right, that came from all of this, right, so you can see all the different species, and the chart over there on the right are the different species and of different energies, we take all that again and convert it to that LET curve, and that's going to guide what we're going to see and how often we're going to see it based on the testing that we do. And then there's trapped particles, right? And so uh, you see the Van Allen probes there spinning around. And again, that depending on where you are in a magnetosphere, how often you're going to be there, what your orbit looks like, dictates the the intensity. So you know what the particle flux is, what and the energy, and how much effect shielding is going to have. Um, the uh, the magnetosphere on Earth is pretty well understood because we have so much stuff there to make the measurements. But uh, JPL in particular. We like to go to other places, and those are not so well understood. So we have limited information based on models and based on some some uh, measurements, and we extrapolate the rest, right? Which means 
<clears throat> we're going to be conservative about what those look like because we don't want to underestimate the environment. But that means we're more constrained with what we can do because of the assumptions that we have to make. Um, but you can see there that that uh, you know Insu worked a lot on. Them. There's a, a my colleague Insu June, um, but a lot of the modeling for for planets in our solar system. So to conclude, the natural space environment part, you know, it's very dynamic. It changes over time, um, and and there are unpredictable events that can happen, right? Um, and the way that you mitigate against these different things changes also depending on where you're going. Uh, and so from my perspective, performing radiation hardness assurance, you'll see RHA in the talk a few more times. You know, we have to design our system to be tolerant to the environment with an understanding of risk. So that speaks back to the rover versus the helicopter. One was very, very risk adverse and one was very, very risk tolerant. They're in the same environment, performing the same operations but their acceptance of risk is very, very different, right? In either case, we need to understand the susceptibility, but it allows us to do different things. So let's get into radiation effects a little. Yeah. Do you usually put like maybe like a plan B device when they start? Like what do you want with like higher bonds, like the backup? Um, so yes and no. I, I wouldn't say like a plan B device from the perspective of a completely different technology, but we'll have what we call cold spares. Yeah. So side A and side B, and it's redundant. And so certainly something like the rover has a side A and side B. Mm -hmm. um, and if something happens and stuff has, <clears throat> not the 2020, but the Mars Science Laboratory, the previous rover, they were running on side A and some weird things happen. You spend a month talking about it and they say, okay, flip the switch, let's go to side B and keep going. Um, with something like the helicopter, you can't afford to do that, right? We're so power constricted and weight constricted, right? There's, there's very little atmosphere in Mars. So to get enough lift, you have to be very, very light, right? And so that means we have to use, we can't afford to have a backup system. So what you do is have kind of just watchdog. If something happens, if you fail in a hard way, meaning destructively, you're done. But if you fail in a soft way and recover, you have kind of these watchdogs uh, that oversee the operation and kind of um, the graceful degradation of what we call it, right? And bring it down into a, in a, in a happy state power cycle and hopefully come back up. So that's kind of a different approach. Um, <clears throat> you can you can also do things like triple modular redundancy, right? So you know even going back to you know original like space shuttle, three computers, right? And so and they're all going to vote. And actually back then they were using different types of, of computational approaches, right? And so um, that is one example. I don't deal with crude flight, just robotics, but I, I guess in some cases, yeah. But typically it's just a side A side B or some kind of voting scheme or something like that. Good question. Uh, from a radiation effects perspective, we're dealing with two different types of things in general. Um, the degradation from total ionizing dose or displacement damage, which is TNID, and then single event effects. So I'm going to go into both of those. From what we do here at the 88, it's a lot of uh, heavy ions and protons for both destructive and non-destructive single event effects. So I'm going to breeze through TID and displacement real quick because, again, I want to focus on what we do uh, up the hill. Um, but you're looking at absorbed dope, uh, dose in a given material, right? And that is like being outside and getting a sunburn. So you're slowly taking on more and more damage, right? Um, from a MOS device perspective, you're looking at threshold shifts in your transistors. So you have a turn on voltage as you're sweeping the gate, that's going to move, right? As you get more TID. Um, and you're looking at more leakage, right? So you have a, a steady state current and that's going to get more and more until you get to functional failure. For bipolar devices, you're looking at increases in base current, which changes your gain. Um, that base current is going to change, collector current is not. And so you have to push the collector harder, right? And so, so your fate is going to change there. Um, and then there's material degradation. I don't really operate in that regime very much, but let's say the glass that covers your solar cells can darken. And that, of course, decreases the efficiency of the solar cells because they're not, not as much light is getting through. Same thing with coverings for cameras and detectors and the like. Right, and these are on the outside of the spacecraft, so they're seeing a lot more radiation um, because the spacecraft itself isn't shielding out those low energy particles, so the dose is a lot higher. Um, just as an example for our Europa mission, which is going for the Jovian environment, the outside is going to see mega rads of dose, right, in silicon, and the inside in the vault is below 300 kilorads, right. So there's a big difference. There's a lot that is lost in terms of transport, in terms of TID. Uh, also, things can become brittle, change the material properties and whatnot. We provide radiation sources to do that, but we don't really study the material science. 
Um, there's some other folks at JPL who work on that. From a mechanism perspective, everything in our field fundamentally is focused on band gap diagram. So I'm gonna try to make this thing work again. I'm sorry if it messes it up, but uh, fair mouse back there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So um, in terms of this band diagram, from left to right, this is actually the device construction, kind of in a vertical sense, right? You've got a gate over here, positively biased gate. You've got your oxide, right, in the middle. And you've got your silicon substrate over here. In the vertical axis, we're looking at energy, right? Um, and so as the ionizing radiation comes in, it doesn't have to happen here. It can happen anywhere in this oxide. Um, you get electron hole pair separation. These electrons are very mobile, right? And so they're going to be pushed by this electric field uh, and pushed over here towards the gate. The holes that are left are going to hop, right? And so they're, they're not as mobile, but they're repelled by this positive voltage and they're going to collect over here. What happens is they get trapped at this interface um, and it takes a lot of energy to push them over here and a lot of energy to push them up. And, would, and so they kind of get stuck in these defects areas. And that's what causes degradation, right? Is this, is this whole trapping that occurs at this boundary over here. Um, and again, that's only in insulators, right? So it's very different from SDE and we're gonna talk about SDE next. The other point that I wanna make is that there, there is, uh, a, a charge yield associated with this, right? So some of these electron hole pair separations are going to recombine. So there's recombination that happens. So the type of radiation and the material that it's going through and the field that exists dictates what that charge yield looks like, right? And so you can see over here, as you have increasing fields and you have the type of radiation, you can see your fractional yield over here. And 12 MeV electrons in cobalt 60 or gamma stores is more or less worst case, right? And so from a practical perspective, when you're testing MOS devices in particular, you want the highest bias that your application is going to see, and you want to use cobalt-60, right? So we have this huge spectrum of, of radiation in space. It's not very practical to try to pick out all of them uh, at, the, at the certain volume and, and try to match that exact thing. What we want to do is just bound it, right? It's the most cost-effective way to determine that we have a bounding case for the degradation that we're going to see, which is why we tend to use gamma stores of cobalt-60 for all of our uh, CID testing. That makes sense? Okay. Um, displacement damage, similar degradation kind of effect. Um, these are lower energy atomic particles, and as they're slowing to coming to rest, or they may be directly from the environment or they may be reaction products, right? Coming from either shielding or for interaction within a device. Um, and they're creating defects in the silicon structure. Um, and those defects are uh, change the resistance of the device, change the, the, the functionality of the device. So you're looking at things like LEDs getting dimmer um, and, and light and optical detection. So basically like an optocoupler, which electrically separates um, electronics. So you have an LED and you have the detector, those things degrade, right? You're seeing more dark current, same thing with uh, uh, CCDs, same thing with uh, solar cells, et cetera, right? More dark current, you're seeing degradation, you're seeing more leakage and eventually failure. So that's a big deal for us too. And we actually do some of that with protons here at the 88. Um, it, we tend to go to other places mostly because we don't want to, heavy ions are more precious to us. So we want to take advantage of the heavy ions that are here. Yeah. Just a question on this. I get that. Displacement damage protons would work for this, but so would neutrons. Yeah. And, and in fact, probably a lot of your effect in space it is, is secondary neutrons. It, it, it comes them. mostly from neutrons. Yeah. Um, but the again, it's kind of the bounding case for us in terms of effects. And so we normalize everything in terms of NEO to so one MBV neutrons in the environment, uh, but tend to use, I don't know, something around 50 MEV protons for all of the testing. Um, and it, it, it comes from just trying to bound the degradation, even though most of it is coming from neutrons. I don't, I don't know how good that surrogacy would be. You know, I know what you're trying to write. You're yeah. trying to get to a maximum value. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that works as well in this, in this case, especially since like with a GCR, you get one Chen GED particle. Mm -hmm. You just have this yeah. broad spectrum yep, of secondary particles coming out. I yeah. don't really know where... Safety. Yeah, it you. I mean, we we try to move between species uh, of of ionizing radiation with the just anneal. Actually, it's who developed the model. <laughs> the model is probably a better person to talk to about it with with neal kind of neal equivalency, right? And so, uh, and again, we, you got to pick which one you're going to use, right? Because you can't 
you're not going to get the shower. You're not going to go pick out different species. You got to pick one bounding case. And the community's landed on using higher energy protons, medium energy protons, I guess, in our world um, to do all that. So I guess is that this is actually not just based on facility availabilities. Well. A lot of what we do is. So if you look at requirements in the European Space Agency for heavy ion testing, it's based on what they can get out of the facilities, right? right? And right. the same thing out of here. Our requirements for LEC used to be lower uh, until Texas A&M came out with, you know, the 15 MeV uh, uh, acceleration with gold, right? You know, we moved our metrics up a little bit. So a lot of it does come from what you can get down here. You may not be wrong. I don't know. I don't know the origination of, of um, I guess, the test requirements for where that came from. Let me ask one other question. Sorry yeah. to derail you, but I mean, really, this is great. And it's such a wonderful, like, overview of what's going on. One thing that's being ignored is activation. Mm -hmm. So when you have GCR, a GCR particle, you get a whole cascade of activation that's going on, which means that you've got then a persistent charge source that's yeah. going on afterwards. Do you know if people try to model this? In any <clears throat> I don't think that we do. The only, uh, I mean, okay. Not from a persistent charge mm -hmm. source perspective. No, I don't, I don't think that's being done. And I think that that's probably probably in the noise relative to the to the direct you know sources like so secondary that it's not a concern um i, I agree with you that it's there but i have to yeah, think about why why it's, why it's not part of the the model and then i remember um, hearing about fission mm -hmm. in particular tom turflinger yeah, yeah, yeah. vision of gold yeah that occurred there i don't think this would be in the noise you get a local charge deposition sure. and a lot of activity in a cascade. I just the, wonder, maybe just for that one. Yeah, but I mean, like, we're there's the iron knee, so we're dealing mostly with lighter stuff. Yeah, higher energy, but much, 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 much lighter, right? You're looking at the relative abundance of these these particles. Yeah. Um, so, thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, no apologies. It's fine. Also, uh, I'm going long. Obviously, if anybody has to leave at four, like, I won't be offended. <laughs> <laughs>
do um, to an extent. So a lot of NASA missions in particular have international collaborators. Um, we try both us and ESA and CERN um, try to publish as much of our data as we can into databases. So if a SpaceX or a Kuiper or even another center wants to use the data from a part that we tested, they don't have to go and retest that because it's just sitting in our drive on our computer. No one knows about it, right? So, so we're not redoing all this testing all the time. So, so in that sense, yes, direct collaboration, not so much in terms of like fundamental research. It, it does happen, but um, not as much as we probably should. Uh, so, you know, that, there's that third ring, collaboration is necessary. So we're, we're trying to do that. Frankly, that's the benefit of me coming here and talking to all of you is, is what can we do, right? Where, where are the areas that we can collaborate? Um, and so uh, there's been definitely a, a sense of, of responsibility at NASA in general, not just JPO, as, as folks who have been leading the field of radiation effects, for, for many, many decades now to kind of step up and, and have these conversations and do these kinds of outreach activities and workforce development. So um, like in a month, I'm gonna be at Texas A&M at the Cyclotron there, and we're doing a, a week long boot camp on how to do radiation effects testing, right? And so we're actually operating on the beam and showing attendees who are not just students at the facility, but folks who are new to the career, right? And it's people from Raytheon, there's people from you know uh, Amazon Kuiper coming from all over to learn how to do this stuff. And so that's really, really important and something that we may explore doing here uh, in the future. So uh, I'll get off the soapbox now and talk a few uh, definitions again. So cross-section from Nuki world, this is more about particle interaction, right? What's the likelihood of something hitting something else? From our perspective, it is what is the physical area of a device and how sensitive something is as a function of LET, right? So you can see this is an example of going up the hill and doing testing. We vary LET by either uh, effective LET actually by either varying angle or energy loss to increase LET or uh, changing species of, of, of ion that we're accelerating, right? And so you can see these discrete points over there as measurements, right? So you're looking at an upset uh, versus LET. We take those discrete points and we fit a continuous curve. And then we convolute that with the transported space environment. And that tells us how often something is going to happen. Right, uh, makes sense. And you can see as we go lower in LET, there's less electron hole pair generation, less effect. And you're gonna see that go down, down, down until it just stops. And that threshold could be 40 or it could be it could be infinite basically. We don't, we, we can't measure an effect, right? And that just means something doesn't occur. And, and that's a goal frankly, because then we don't have to deal with it. Uh, <laughs> but we don't often get to choose that. Visually, right, it's, it is literally just, cumulative area of a device. So here we were using a pulse laser to simulate a heavy ion. Uh, again, the laser is focused to a micron and it's pulsed very quickly, like on a femtosecond scale. So it emulates what a heavy ion or, or a proton is going to do in terms of an SCE. And so you can see as you lower laser energy, the same kind of thing is happening. The sensitive area is decreasing, right? And so visually, this is what's happening. We're just doing it with a broad beam and putting enough fluence on a device to get that measurement back out. Make sense? It's, it's the same, we stole the verbiage from you all, but we use it in a different way. Um, so again, single event effects. This is different from TID. Again, TID and, and displacement damage degradation over time. Here, we're seeing a disturbance in overall operation that, that likely recovers unless it's destructive, and then the part is just done. Uh, instantaneously destructive. And this is coming from one eye, right? So this is not we're doing this in a very accelerated way, right? Where we're subjecting the part to a much, much higher flux than it would see in its space environment. But um, uh, we want to make sure that the effect we're measuring is not from like pileup, not from multiple strikes happening in a short time period, right? So we have this game that we play with the flux that we're we're irradiating with and trying to get our job done and not stay up for you know three days straight, which sometimes happens. Um, and so there's, there's a whole list of SEEs. I'll, there's another table I'll go into. Uh, I don't want to keep you here all night, so I'm going to skip SEE. But the point I really wanted to make here is, is that single event effects really kicked off in the mid to late 70s. And so it's a relatively young field. I mean, the heyday was the 80s, and that was happening up here at the 88, at least for JPL. Um, on the other coast, you know, Goddard and, and company were over at the Tandem Van de Graaff at Brookhaven National Lab doing the same kind of studies. But in the 80s, like all the fundamental mechanisms and research was taking place and being kind of refined in the 90s. 
and then into the 2000s and, and into now, we're really just, you know, coming into our more production phase, I'll say, of single event effects. Um, from a mechanism perspective, uh, what you see there is kind of uh, time versus what's going on, right? So uh, in, in caption A there, there's a reverse bias junction, uh, which is really the most sensitive part of the circuit from an SCE perspective, right? So you see a PN, uh, a PN junction there, uh, where the N is positive and, and negative. P sub, and negative P substrate. So when uh, an ion is coming through, you see the cylindrical track of electron hole pairs. That's like submicron kind of thing, right? Uh, instantaneously at first. And then you have that bias, you have that field. So in B, you're seeing that those electrons are being collected up, right? With that, with that positive bias, they're attracted there. And that results in a current pulse, right? And with some resistance, that results in voltage pull. Um, this is very like, you know, cartoonish, but that, that's what's happening, right? It's, more, it's far more complicated than that, but that's what's going on, right? And so that's called drift. And then we have diffusion, these things go back. So as long as there was nothing destructive, uh, in general for SCE, everything is going back to its steady state. So you can see that on the right there, and this is all happening in a nanosecond, right? So very quickly, this, this charge collection in that sensitive volume is occurring in about a nanosecond. And you can see the different phases when we go back. There's going to be some dose associated with that, but remember that's happening in your oxides. It's not happening here in the PN junction. Um, and unless something is destructive, you know, we just go back to a steady state from a current perspective. Now, things can change because we're also talking about, oh, one other point. Um, it's also not this simple from the fact that, you know, it's not just one PN junction. There are many, 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 many PN junctions, right? You have a very complicated device with different kinds of structures, right? And so we're trying to see the effect happening in, in many different kinds of effects that may manifest in different ways from the outside of the device looking in from a, you know, we're operating these devices while they're in the beam and seeing what happens. Um, yeah, that's more or less what I wanted to say. And where that ion hits, sorry, where that ion hits is important too, right? So there's a picture of it going right through that junction, but it can happen near the junction and a little bit further from the junction. And that means that that current transient and resulting voltage transient is not going to be as big, right? And it can be, that charge can be collected from multiple fields, right? There could be multiple P injunctions taking on those electrons. <clears throat> so what I want, I'm not going to go through this whole table, but what I wanted to point out here is that you've got different types of uh, devices from a, a process perspective, from a functionality perspective, and then all kinds of different um, uh, events, right? So single event transient, I'll talk about briefly single event upset, again, briefly functional interrupt, uh, latch up, burnout, gate rupture, dielectric rupture. Those are the main ones, but there's others. And that's the fun part of this field is like, you can see a new effect and give it your name or something like you get to name stuff all the time. Um, but yeah, as, as a radiation effects engineer, it's my job to look at a part and try to figure out before going to the beam, all the things I have to worry about, because that's going to dictate how I test what I'm testing. So from a single bit transient perspective, you can think about a voltage regulator, right? You're taking in, let's say, 12 volts and outputting 5 volts. And that's steady state for the most part, unless you get hit with an ionizing particle, and then you're going to see a transient. So that charge collection that you saw is happening quickly, right? Like nanoseconds. The resulting effect could be up to microseconds, right? Because there's there's capacitance involved, right? At the, at the device level and even the circuit level. So that's gonna slow that uh, transient propagation down. And so you can see some uh, longer effects because of that. Um, that can be positive. And you say, well, why do I care? I get a voltage transient. Well, that positive transient could damage downstream electronics, right? You're powering something, it can't take it's supposed to, it's expecting five volts, but you get a 10 volt transient because you had a 12 volt bias that could pop the part. Um, it could be negative and it could be very sensitive and that may cause resets to a power supply or a detector. And if your satellite is resetting every hour, that's a problem too, right? So it's important for us to understand that. Um, I just wanted to point out, not everything you measure may be as important to your, to your system. I'll kind of, we'll get going here. Um, SEUs, so memory bit flip. Right. Uh, these come in all different kinds of forms or different kinds of memories. You've got SRAMs, you've got DRAMs, you've got non-volatile memory flash. Um, this is just a strike to that, that uh, element, that storage cell that causes the state to change right? from a zero to a one or one to a zero. Um, it's important for us to understand whether it's a true single event upset or multiple bit upset. Multiple bit upset is when an ion strike comes through and causes multiple bits to upset by the same single particle. Right. And that's important because your computers, your phones, all the modern electronics have error detection and correction codes. Um, 
uh, EDAC that take care of these, these bit flips, not just from a radiation perspective, but from a noise perspective, right? The, the voltage margins are so low that there's lots of errors just intrinsically in the device operating. And so they have to deal with that. But if you get, they're only expecting, you know, a certain rate of bit flip, the particle comes in and goes down a word line and causes half the word to flip, then that's a problem, right? So we need to understand that as well. Uh, functional interrupt. So this is an example of different things. I'm not sure how, and you can kind of see this here. So this is like say a GPU, right? We're transmitting an image. And so that's what we expect. Over here, you can see kind of what we would call a column CEPI. Um, so there's that column of the image is, is being distorted. And then over there, the whole thing is being distorted, right? And so what happens is it's just an upset, but it's an upset in the control logic. Um, you know, your row addressing, your column addressing, whatever it is, and it causes mass disruption to the device. Um, that could be a memory, it could be a GPU, it could be a processor. Like Leif was talking about, blue screen of death, we would call that a set. And we just usually either hit reset or turn the thing off and turn it back on, just like your phone when it's acting funny. <clears throat> One of the things we worry about the most is latch up. Um, I won't go deep into the mechanisms here. I know I'm running out of time, but basically this is the parasitic short between power and ground. So you're seeing a, a vertical P and P um, in CMOS, right? So you have a complementary metal oxide and then a lateral and PN. And so this creates a thyristor. And if an ion strike comes through and uh, has enough charge to basically board bias those BJTs, those parasitic BJTs, there's not actually BJTs in there, right? These are parasitics. The, the BJTs, the holding voltage is enough from the power supply to sustain that. The holding current is enough to sustain it. And there's a gain greater than one for both of those. You get this parasitic path. And that could be a dead short where now power and ground are, are shorted hard and all of that energy is going through your device. And that means things are melting like it's gone. Right? Yeah. Why aren't you just throwing like a coffee? I was just saying like a negative gain. Like a small gain. Like from a, I mean, we're not so. This is not something that we designed. This is a, a byproduct that, well, one, a lot of the devices that we test aren't designed for space, right? So it's just, it is what it is. They're designing for power, they're designing, designing for speed, and they're designing for cost. And so we're stuck with it. And so we want to go and see if it's going to exhibit this behavior, one. Um, and then two, you can do things to manufacture against latch up. So a lot of this is, you know, you see that this is happening down in the substrate. Right, so you can change substrate doping. You can put the things down on epitaxial layers, right? So that charge sharing that's happening down here isn't happening. Um, you can space out well contacts, so you put them further away, right? Um, there's lots of things that, as a manufacturer of a device, you could do. But what's the benefit, right? The cost to do that for a market that is so small, right? Like we're going to buy five of your parts. Can you spend a million dollars uh, changing your process for us? They're going to be like, yeah, okay. <laughs> um so so that's why um and so there's 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 i mean money rules everything right and so there's got to be a benefit for somebody to do that now if we're making our own thing which sometimes we do we make asics we want to make sure we use a process that's well understood and a process that's going to be resilient to these kinds of effects right. yeah so yeah i mean we know what to do it's just people don't want to do it for us yeah it's you know, economy of scale um and even if it's not instantaneously destructive there's been lots of research on um kind of, uh, uh, I guess, long-term degradation of the reliability of the device. So you can see thinning in metal lines, see bulbous metal there coming out, the uh, latent damage that, that a latch up event uh, uh, induces can reduce the lifetime, just even down to weeks, right? A part that should be lasting 10 years is now lasting weeks. And if you go to the beam and you test, you're like, oh, it's fine. I power cycled, it came back to its original state, uh, but it may not be fine. Question. We can be. We're in vacuum or we're in air. We don't get down to that level, frankly. It's not like we're very focused on. Um, so we're very focused on kind of device level effects. I mean, we're not we're not ever going in and, and looking at things at that level. Your boundaries does that include a community temperature? So yes, so that's a good question. So depending on the effect, the the there's environmental impact. So for latch up, high temperature is worst case, right? And that has to do with uh, the, the parasitic gains, basically, or amplification, right? So high temperature is worst case there, and higher voltage, you know, more field, more energy, et cetera, is worst case. Can be more sensitive to latch up 
So, you know, we have a heat gun that we use at the facility when we were testing in air um, and some thermal monitoring. And so when we're doing our latch up testing, we want to put that part in this worst case temperature, um, either for the mission or just by the data sheet, right? If we don't have uh, a maximum allowable flight temperature spec out by thermal analysis, we're just going to do the worst case. That does two things. One, it bounds the testing, but two, allows us to determine effect. A big part of our job is to like understand what exactly is happening. And a CEPI can cause an increase in current, but a latch can cause an increase in current. But because of this kind of stuff, latent damage, it's important to discern the two different mechanisms, right? And so CEPI, for the most part, there's always corner cases, it's not going to be temperature dependent. But if we throw temperature on it and we see an increase in cross section, right, then we're like, ah, latch up. And that's important. Um, for other things like single event burnout, lower temperature is actually worst case. For things like upset, CEPI, et cetera, lower voltage is worst case, right? There's uh, less critical charge required for the effect to occur. So it, it, it depends what you're looking for and testing for. It's going to dictate what those uh, that parameter space is. So it's really important to know what you're looking for. You don't just like kind of put the part in and hit it and see what happens, right? Because you may be not bounding the, the testing that you're doing the right way. Yeah. Do these devices have like passive where it's like passive shutdown or safety where it's like, oh, like you know, like this one, there's like some hot sort of like passive. So there's there's like protection diodes and things. Um and, and so that will deal with you know short transients and over voltage. Um you know, internally, not so much from the perspective of like does something happen inside, like there's a voltage regular aid inside the part, which sometimes those are embedded inside. And there's an over voltage transient, like it's not designed for that, it may kill the part. Um, externally, you know, we do deal, we create mitigating circuits, we may add capacitance to stop a transient or limit its propagation, right? Um, we may use external protection diodes, things like that, to deal with different kinds of variations. Um, I'm coming to an end, I promise. And so I just wanted to kind of correlate. The natural space environment to what we do terrestrially. I mentioned charging early on, and we we do that uh, at JPL. We have our dynamitron, which is a 3 MeV electron source. Didn't talk about it today because it's mostly on uh, materials, insulators, and things, and, and solar cells. Also, we have uh, in terms of degradation, but internal and external charging, as I mentioned, um, and then from the perspective of TID testing and displacement damage testing. Uh, again, cobalt 60 in general looks at both materials. Uh, we can use a dynamitron for that again, but the charge yield is problematic, right? We want a bounding condition. So typically we use the gamma source and we have three of those on lab that we use. And then uh, single event effects, both direct and indirect, talk mostly about heavy ions, but protons in some devices uh, can cause effects from direct ionization. So the, the LET of a proton is pretty low, like 0.1, um, but there's reaction products, right? So that's spallation, it's a silicon atom, and you can get a spectrum of LET off that reaction product, right? Up to up to 15, but really we're talking about LETs eight and, eight and below. Um, and so we do have to worry about that too. Typically, because the effects of heavy ions are more pronounced, we'll start there. And if we see a low LET sensitivity, we may go and do photon testing to kind of refine what that looks like, right? So if we're seeing anything below an LET of 15, we assume it may be sensitive to protons because of those uh, reaction products, and we may go test with protons as well. Um, just a couple more slides. And so uh, philosophically, from a radiation harness assurance perspective, you know, we deal with meal. And I, I kind of touched on this, but I wasn't explicit about it. Mission, environment, application, life, right? So what's your risk tolerance of emission? Where are you going? What radiation are you going to see? Are you going to be in trapped, trapped uh, particle belts? Are you going to be on the surface of Mars, right? What are you doing? Um, how critical is the operation in a given phase of the mission? Is it during a landing phase or an orbital insertion phase? Or is it just part of your science and you can handle resetting once a month? Uh, and how long are you going to be there, right? That speaks more to TID typically, but also if, you know, for Mars helicopter, our original uh, goal was five flights of 90 seconds. We're not powered on that long. That means if there are destructive SDEs, the likelihood of occurring are very, very low, right? You have to be powered on for a single event effect. And so you take all of that and you iterate, right? So there's this large hardness assurance iteration process. Um, you're going through a design, you get a parts list, you evaluate that parts list, you know, what's, what's, what types of components, what's their process and where are they going? And that, that's where the environment comes in, right? So we have, 
folks like Insu who define the environment, do that transport for us and give us a document that says, this is what you're gonna see. Those two things drive requirements. So then it's a, you need all of your components to pass to an LET at 37 or 75. So then we come here, we go up the hill, we go to the 88, we do that testing, we either pass or we, we measure their susceptibility and we determine a rate. Okay, it didn't pass, but it's only gonna happen this often, right? And so we'll look at that and likelihood, how often it's gonna happen and consequence dictates our risk, right? So a low risk, a medium risk, a high risk. Um, we'll take that information, we'll come back, we'll look at what we saw. We may have to do more testing. We keep iterating, right? We put that into a model in terms of the system, right? And do systems engineering. And that process just keeps happening and keeps getting refined until we achieve a level of risk we're comfortable with, right? So there's always this cost risk kind of back and forth and what's acceptable. We made promises for the spacecraft we're gonna build, right? We told NASA it's gonna succeed, right? To a certain level of risk and we took money to do that. So we kind of have to make that happen, right? But you can't spend an infinite amount of time or money to you know, polish the cannonball and get to that, to that 99.999999% confidence. Um, and so uh, that concludes, thanks for hanging out. I know that I took a long time, but again, as I mentioned, I think the best part of this field is, is it, that it's multidisciplinary and nuanced. There's always something new, like 20 years, I'm still like learning new things and figuring stuff out and trying to problem solve all the time, right? Um, and I think, like that chart said in the in the SCE overview, my soapbox, we have to collaborate more, right? I I'm, I try to stop in and say hi. It's not just to say hi, it's to make sure, you know, let's see how things are going, right? Um, let's talk about where we can take the facility in the future, those kinds of things, right? Um, and, this, don't worry. Yeah. Um, and then you saw my title, I don't speak Latin. I don't know if you do for that, <laughs> but... Um, from the stars to the earth and back to the stars. It's this, it's this cycle, right? We we take the the, the you know uh, somewhat limited understanding of, of space and we take that down here and try to figure out how to get stuff back up there, right? How do we take what we know, try to get something back out in space and learn more? And then that cycle continues, right? And so that's that's really what's fun and, and exciting and important about what we do is we're simulating that environment down here in order to learn more about that environment up there. So that is it. Happy to take questions.